Good morning. I'm going to speak quickly because I have another speech to give in half an hour, so uh, I don't have much time. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad that this conference is taking place to uh, be able to look at uh, different strategies of, of e-governance and, uh, and to share it as much as possible, uh, especially for the Eastern Partnership countries uh, that uh, perhaps have started later with their government reforms, uh, but uh, that is that is not necessarily a disadvantage as we discovered when uh, we took advantage of uh, the fact that we didn't get stuck with, uh, we were so far behind we didn't get stuck with with legacy technologies, we had to start from scratch. So uh, that does, in fact, uh, offer you an advantage if you use it right, uh, but also use this to push your country towards being uh, more effective in governance and more transparent. And so that's, I'm glad that so many of you are here from, from the Eastern Partnership countries as well as the countries, uh, as well as from countries um, elsewhere. Uh, this is a, uh, I mean, I'm firmly convinced that the way to go in um, in making in developing a new, efficient, uh, and open form of government is through uh, massive digitization. Um, I am right now uh, co-chairing or the uh, the World Bank's first uh, first uh, development report on IT and development. Uh, uh, for the past 70 years, the World Bank has been funding, uh, you know, irrigation projects, malaria eradication, hospitals, all kinds of things like that. And and finally, they started. Uh, they, I guess, because of requests or something, they got to the point where they said, "Well, we better see if IT and development have anything to do with each other." And then the economists uh, there uh, looked at the countries that were doing, seemed to be doing the most, uh, and they were Finland and South Korea and Singapore and Estonia. And then they, then they realized that, well, in fact, three of those countries started on their uh, dramatic, uh, route towards, um, digitization when they were already rather well off among the richest countries, uh, whereas Estonia was the one country that, uh, while it ranked up there with them as far as, in many ways, I would argue are even better. But uh, they, uh, we started with really nothing in the kind of the, the morass and the miasma that was the post-Soviet world in 1991-92. Um, now, when it comes, when insofar as we're focusing here on the Eastern Partnership, uh, let's keep in mind, next week the Eastern Partnership will have its summit in Riga, and that it will be a crucial um, political event that uh, I hope uh, brings about some so, uh, some changes in uh, in the relationship between the European Union and the Eastern Partnership country. We certainly see e-governance as a major tool for uh, for developing uh, cooperation. Um, at the same time, of course, the European Union stands before some major challenges as well, because we do not have a digital single market in the European Union. We have a single market for material goods, but when it comes to digital services, uh, we are way, way, way behind. And uh, unless we resolve that issue within the European Union, we are going to fall even more behind. Um, but what is important about the uh, part, <clears throat> the uh, about the summit next week is that uh, for us certainly it was uh, the um, it was the perspective that of of moving forward toward the European Union that uh, gave us um, the kind of momentum to carry out reforms, um, and we here, having based on our own experience, are firmly convinced that we that by giving our partners the motivation and support to move forward with reforms, uh, we can uh, get you closer and closer. So anyway, let me just run through a bunch of topics. First of all, let me just start um, with a personal story, which is uh, the whole idea of e-governance, internetization of society, or at least computers, um, came to me somewhere in the very early 90s. Uh, but because of my particular past, which uh, which led to things that I then pushed for, which was that I had, uh, thanks to a very, very innovative and bright 
uh, math teacher. Uh, I was taught to program when I was age 13. Uh, I'm 61, so you can do the math. Uh, it, was a, it was a long time ago. And um, uh, the main thing I got out of that was that even though I didn't end up doing much in my life uh, in computer programming, but the fact that I knew how to program meant that when I went to university, I, I easily went from the original simple language of BASIC to programming in hexadecimal assembler language on a PDP-8, which is a computer that had 8K of memory, and I'm trying to find something that is as big as that was, but it's enough to know that if you take all those boxes there, put them together, that's about the size of a PDP-8, which you had to program in hexadecimal assembler language because uh, if you have a maximum of 8K memory, which is less than your an empty email these days, uh, you have to program only in numbers and letters. Um, but one of the thing, the important thing that came out of that that once if you learn to prog program at an early age or code as we say today, then it's 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 just like a foreign language except it's it, there are no irregular verbs. Uh, I mean, they're just, it's just regular and it's logical and there's no reason why kids can't learn how to program and I would urge all of you to embark on some kind of program to teach kids to program at an early age. Now, when the study became independent in 1991, or re-independent, um, I mean, the big worry is what are we going to do? What's, what's going to happen? We're such a small country. We're, we've fallen so far behind. We knew that after 50 years of Soviet occupation, the depredations of mass deportations, lack of development, obnoxious Soviet rule, censorship, that there were things we didn't want. And we also we knew that we had, there were a whole lot of things we had to do. Um, and certainly, when you look at the standard measures of, of development, uh, you, where you look at infrastructure, physical infrastructure, concrete bridges, roads, overpasses, hospitals, um, that we were basically a developing country. Uh, we had been left behind. In 1939, Estonia and our northern neighbor, Finland, uh, had more or less the same GDP per capita and on different, different uh, measures. Uh, one was ahead, the other one was ahead. We, for example, were actually ahead in telephony or telephone, numbers of telephone exchanges per capita than Finland. Um, but we had nothing here that was even remotely like modern, uh, modern communication technology. And so pondering all this and despairing, um, uh, I was sitting in Washington at the time as our first post-independent uh, ambassador, when suddenly in 1993, Mosaic appeared. That was the first web browser. It's important to keep in mind, it was 22 years ago only that the first web browser came. Uh, and so sort of thinking about, well, we have, we have a web browser and we have, we have a lot of really smart people in Estonia because we did have a good uh, STEM system, meaning science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, education. Um, and so it struck me that actually we could be on a level playing field in this area. We may not, it'll take us many, many decades to build the kinds of roads that we might want here to, so that they would be indistinguishable from the, from the autobahns in Germany. But certainly in the, in the area of, of technology, we could leap ahead. Um, so while the rest of the world seemed to be complaining about how bad computerization was and uh, how modern technology is going to ruin us all, um, we in fact saw it as a multiplier. Um, and so we, have, we embarked on this different path. Now we of course also, what another motivating factor for me at least was that, um, especially in the early 90s, everyone was talking about economies of scale. Economies of scale, this, this economy of scale, that. You know, if it's big, it works. If it's small, it doesn't. Um, and so, of course, here, as a, as a country of 1.3 million, it can be pretty despairing to see that, well, you can only really make it if you're big. Uh, and they're talking about companies that are often about the size of the country. So what, what I did was I, uh, well, instead of despairing, I read a Luddite, a neo-Marxist book by Jeremy Rifkin called The End of Work, which some of you may have read, which appeared about 23 years ago, which argued that, well, in fact, computerization is really bad, 
uh, because no one will have jobs anymore. And he brought the example of a, um, of a, a Kentucky steel mill in the United States that, was bought, uh, that employed 12,000 people and produced X million tons of steel. And then the Japanese bought it, they automated it, computerized it, and then they were still producing X ton million tons of steel a year, but they only had 120 people. Now this, of course, for Rifkin, was an example of why computerization is really bad, because they're all going to lose jobs. But w coming from a country of then 1.4 million, they said, wow, this is great. This is exactly what we need. We can inc increase the functional size of our economy by do having machines and computers do all the things that, in fact, we would have people do, but why let them do things that computers and machines can do better? So, um, in order to move ahead, um, really we had to focus on education. Uh, if you want a level playing field, uh, then you, as I mentioned from my own experience, start with the kids, getting, get them to use the technology. Um, even before you start teaching the program, you have to have everyone connected. This is the access problem that is that it still plagues much of the world, but here, basically through, uh, through some tweaks that we used, uh, by 1998, Estonian schools were all online and there were computers available for children. Later on, we implemented an analogy, somewhat different, but still for the same reason, a program to educate older people how to use computers. It was kind of a, par a public-private partnership with the banks because the banks clearly wanted to see people use computers. And so that's basically how we kick-started the original sort of di digital development, is building up the infrastructure that you need. But what it did do at that time was it uh, kicked off this trend uh, to look for technological IT solutions where other countries didn't really do it yet. Um, and as I mentioned, partially because they were locked into digital technology. I mean, I'll give you a kind of example, which is that in, uh, uh, they were locked into legacy technology. I mean, one example would be uh, the, digi the analog telephone exchange that, uh, that dated from 1979, so in 1992, it was only 13 years old, that the city of Helsinki was willing to give us for free. Um, and uh, so, and people here, this is, you know, we're poor, we don't have any money, someone's giving us it for free. He said, okay, great. And I fought that tooth and nail and won because we did not want to get an analog telephone system from 1979 for Estonia in 1992. Rather, we want to have a 1992 digital system for Estonia in 1992. And so you have, this, it's a battle you will fight constantly where if you're, especially if you're, if you're, uh, economically in difficult straits, people will offer their, their not junk, but their old stuff. Um, certainly when it comes to technology and IT, never take old stuff, uh, just forget it. Um, but we did have, we did start then, uh, I mean, g g we got to the point where by 1993, uh, our entire telephone system was digitized and I had a far better connection between Tallinn, Estonia, and Washington, D.C., in the embassy, because it's all digital, than I did between the, my, the, my embassy and the U.S. State Department, because that was all analog and the connections were bad, and they had wangs there, which are these word processing machines. They didn't have computers, so you couldn't send an email, and the only place I ever had to send a fax to was the U.S. State Department. Um, but this, again, showed us that you can, in fact, advance and be faster than others if you want to do it. Um, now, the other thing about all this, it can't be just top down. Uh, what you, you do need to work also on the development of civil society um, in developing a country. And uh, the question is, how do you do this using technology? Well, um, where... Um, where in many, uh, many post-communist countries, there's, a, there's this legacy of atomization of society, where you know, when the communists took over, they, uh, they basically destroyed civil society. And uh, they basically left three 
forms of uh, organizations in place. There was the Communist Party, then there was the Komsomol for the younger people, and then third of all, you had the labor unions, which are labor unions about as much as, well, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> they're not labor unions, but they were all, uh, they were all instruments of control. Now, uh, when, uh, if, if any of you have read Robert Putnam, Making Democracy Work, then you know that actually the, if you really want, it, democracies work well when you have a strong civil society. And now you say, well, how does, this, how does this relate to technology? Well, one example here in Estonia is a project which is, which you can all look up. It's called Let's Do It World.org. But is, uh, which is now in 97, if not 100 countries, that uh, actually uh, was started here in Estonia. And it was, uh, it's an example of exactly what, where technology and societal development interact. Namely, we had, uh, as you probably know, or maybe you don't know, but Skype was developed in this country and uh, for Estonians who, after they didn't go to jail for starting Kazaa, a file swapping program. Then they uh, then they started. Then they invented Skype. Uh, and two of the guys who did that mm, were kind of green oriented. And we have, uh, we'll, as in many societies, uh, there's a lot of trash around. People, especially when you became more capitalist, didn't want to pay the money you had to pay to get rid of your garbage. So what do they do? They go in the woods. They throw, it, or they go to some place, some empty lot somewhere, throw their garbage out. Well, this becomes kind of ugly after a while, and so what? Uh, so what? Uh, what the Let's Do It World, or at that time just Let's Do It people did, was that they developed an app whereby you can you could photograph garbage somewhere. Say there's a pile of garbage, a big pile of garbage in the middle of the woods, and it would the photograph would then be taken, and its GPS coordinates would be sent to a central. Uh, planning place where all these places were then um, were all registered, and then we had another IT company, sort of a, a logistics company, that also donated its uh, software to figure out how to best clean up. What's the best route to go and clean up this garbage? So we ended up having this thing, a massive participation in the country. We had our the most uh, the most recent iteration of this. I guess the sixth or seventh was last week. But it, it is a, it is a, it is something that is that in, in involves civil society doing voluntary work for society. But it wouldn't be possible without the technology. And so now, because technology, which was all free and everything given to everyone, um, is what is in almost a hundred countries worldwide. Um, these are the kinds of things you can do, and you can do this because most people these days do have one way or another smartphones in most countries, and you can in fact uh, or get mobilize your side to do interesting issues. Um, now, uh, and, and if you want to know more about it, just Google "Let's Do It World .org and you can read all about it. Uh, which I, I, whoops, <laughs> they say it's now it's up to 112 countries. Uh, have had this, and 12 million people have been involved. Um, one of the other benefits of actually using, um, of really getting um, your country uh, as digitized as possible, uh, is is making your society transparent. Um, because it's not just making things cheaper and more efficient, but it's also making life more transparent. Um, I, I've been saying for years, you can't bribe a computer. Uh, if you don't, uh, the, the more decisions that are discretionary, that is, the, the you leave up to people, especially on issues that shouldn't really be very discretionary, but it's just that if you check or check all the boxes, you know, I mean, I know one I, it's an example that I don't have here today, but because uh, I tried to show it at the World Bank once, and the only thing that came up was permission to dig a hole. Uh, you have to apply for permission in this country to dig a hole. Well, okay, so you, get, you know, you check off all the all the little boxes. Yes, I've done this, this, that. No, there isn't a cable there. All this stuff you check out, and then you just send it off, and then you get permission. Well, and some other place where you have to go to an official, he's like, well, I could sort of, well, if you give me something, I can give you permission to dig a hole. I mean, it's an absurd example, but nonetheless, the point is to make non-discretionary decisions or entitlement decisions something which um, is 
done um, digitally on the internet. Everything is, if everything checks out, then you just get it. Um, and this is, this leads to a much more transparent system. Now, of course, you, on a more, on a more developed basis, uh, e-taxation in general is a, is a way to get dramatic increases in compliance in the revenue flow. We have been doing um, since, basically, well, since the 90s, but sort of at a really sort of high level digital um, tax returns on income tax since uh, the late 90s. Uh, compliance uh, increased dramatically with, uh, with online tax, tax forms. People are much more interested in it. It's much easier to do especially if you're a salaried employee, because then there's really not much else you have to account for. Uh, we have now moved on to cross-border, well, we're, we've moved on to cross-border VAT, or more importantly, we've gone over to VAT uh, being all declared automatically online, which again, led to a dramatic surge in compliance, because if it's all digital, and you have to, it's digitally there, it's all open, it's transparent. Um, it's much harder to do funny business, especially what we were finding was happening was that if you have, um, if you have countries with mother, mother and daughter companies, they're always saying uh, in the other country, we paid it back there. So you have these, this, this possibility of cheating. I wouldn't say cheating, of course, about our good enterprises, but of, uh, playing with the numbers goes away. Um, so taxation is another place where transparency and openness leads to better compliance, more money, and also to a more honest system. Um, now, when you say that, uh, I mean, if you look at Transparency International, uh, Estonia is by far the least corrupt post-communist country, we, we're in the world in place number 26, along with France. Um, we are less corrupt than just about every single country in the European Union that has had fiscal difficulties, and actually within the European Union in the 2014 numbers, which are the last ones we have, Estonia is in 11th place in the European Union out of 28. So we're in the top half of the EU, and I would, I would argue uh, much of that has to do with the transparency that is part of our society and system today. Um, and I think this is where we must be going uh, uh, overall in society, especially the more globalization we have, that in fact um, countries like mine ultimately may end up being at a disadvantage because we're more open. Um, corruption is more difficult uh, and we don't really want to, that. You'll see the companies or those who want to do things kind of in a shady way won't want to come here. I mean, we don't want people to do anything shady, but the point is that as the world becomes more interconnected, we're going to have to require transparency uh, within areas, for example, as in the European Union. Um, the other, another issue you must face very seriously in... Um, uh, in developing a digital society, and we have seen this more and more, is the issue of internet freedom. Um, where, well, right now Estonia is number two in the world in internet freedom. It used to be number one, but then we didn't get worse, but Iceland got better. Um, uh, but, and this is, uh, the, the rating is done annually by uh, Freedom House. Uh, but if you look at the, globally, the situation is not good. I'm just going to make the tea with him. My dad. Oh, okay. Uh, if you look at that, um, if you look at that graph, you'll see that the the blue, or then when it's mixed with the red, it becomes purple, is internet freedom over the past. I guess I can't see the number. Fifteen years, whatever. Uh, as you can see, the number of countries with free with you know, where there is no censorship or restrictions on internet freedom has been declining dramatically. It got a little better, then it got worse again. On the other hand, if you look at the countries in pink, or you see the graph in pink, you'll see that it, it, the situation is not good. Uh, we see more and more of the internet being restricted. Um, 
Of 65 countries that were assessed by Freedom House in 2014, 36 have a negative trajectory on freedom, um, freedom online and And the most significant declines were in three countries, uh, basically, is it that? Yep, no, Russia, Turkey, and Ukraine. Um, this is not a, I mean, this is, not, this, is, this is a worrisome sign if we see that um, the internet, which is something which can be used to, uh, to enlighten people, bring news, get discussion going, is in fact being restricted in ways that rather reduces the free flow of information and ideas. Um, what we, uh, and this touches upon also when we're talking about freedom of ideas, is also what are we talking, uh, where are we when it comes to surveillance? Uh, certainly there's been a lot of, a lot of attention paid to the issue of surveillance uh, since the revelations two years ago by, by Edward Snowden. Uh, of the 65 countries um, in the Freedom House report la last year, 19 passed new legislation on increased surveillance or restricted user anonymity. Um, that is, and that is always justified with the with the need for security. Now, um, this is this is an issue that we will be facing for a long time. It's there's privacy and there's transparency, and there and these will clash. A perfect example of privacy versus <clears throat> transparency, which is not on the internet, but I mean Estonia being very much on the transparency side of things, pushed through several years ago the requirement that uh, all EU common agri agricultural policy disbursements be made public. Because before, they weren't. It was just that you, I mean, 40%, that's 400 billion euros over a seven-year period, was distributed to farmers or to companies. And no one knew how much, we knew how much a country would get. We didn't know who got it. And of course, you heard this thing, oh, this is all for the, you know, the small farmer making his special goat cheese in a story, you know, all that stuff. Well, then when uh, we pushed through this thing that made it a requirement, you found out that, well, in fact, there were just big agribusiness companies that were getting all the money. And in fact, this, there was quite a myth about the tiny little specialist goat cheese maker. But then the countries, other countries in the EU pushed back and took the European Union to court. And, and they won the court case saying that this was a violation of their privacy. Now, our position is that if it's public money, we have to know where public money goes. I mean, if you pay your taxes and the taxes go to your government and the government takes that money and gives it to the European Union for disbursement, we ought to know where it's going. Whereas they said it's, it is a violation of privacy for, for the public to know that, you know, one of these big agribusiness companies have been getting all this money. Um, so these are, as I said, this is, this is an issue that, I mean, we're not just talking about, um, <clears throat> you know, totalitarian or authoritarian regimes where we have issues of privacy versus transparency. You have to, you have to look at this mm, more broadly in the world, and even in the highly democratic European Union, we are facing, we face this problem regularly. Um, now, but national security does have, it does have an important role to play in this. Uh, let, let's be honest, and I can say from Estonia's point of view, from uh, our experience in 2007, you know, where technology has become so important, you no longer need to bomb a country to, or occupy it to, to um, immobilize it. All you have to do is knock out its critical infrastructure, which no longer, do, it needs to be done with rockets, but you can knock out a country's critical infrastructure digitally. And um, I mean, this represents a whole new set of problems. Um, I mean, it's not simply what we had here were DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks that restricted access to websites. But you can do, actually, once you get into the system, you can do far more damage if you really want, and Stuxnet is a perfect example of that. 
but the main point is you do have to worry about national security these days when it comes to all of your digital infrastructure because more and more of what you do in life is goes over the internet. IOT, Internet of Things, everything from your refrigerator to your cars uh, are going to be running on various protocols that come over the internet. I got to drive in a Tesla the other day and everything in the Tesla is constantly being downloaded from the internet. Um, well, I mean, this is good. I mean, very nice. On the other hand, you really do have to start worrying about internet. Um, but the security of your infrastructure, be it in your car, or in your, your whatever, everything that is, is going to be using or is going to be based on the internet infrastructure in place. So, I mean, th things such as on-time delivery, how milk is delivered to your supermarket, all of this these days is done over the internet automatically. And if you start screwing around with that, you can really be, you can, the country can really be in, in trouble. So we need to learn risk management. We need how to, time is running out. I'll soon be done. I have to go give my other talk, as I said. Um, we have to learn cyber defense. These are all things that um, that you know, we, we originally did not think about and now we have learned the hard way are real serious issues. Training people about behaving securely on the internet. Um, getting the private sector to get to be involved in internet security is another big issue because the private sector does not necessarily want to actually, I mean, I have my business secrets, I don't want anyone to know, but if you're, if you're, going, to, uh, if you're going to participate in this world, uh, you're going to have to take some minimal strategies to, to uh, keep yourself secure. In this modern world, if, you, uh, if, you're, if your electrical plant is taken out by a cyber attack, it is not an act of God. By definition, a cyber act is not an act of God. It is not force majeure. And you should probably not get any money for insurance because you didn't take enough measures to safeguard your electrical supply or generation station. And so too with banks. If you do not have adequate, if you do not have adequate security measures for keeping people's money uh, and it gets stolen, then you do not, should not, get to write it off as a business loss or a business expense. It is an act of theft, and it's just like leaving your car door unlocked. Um, now, we have addressed these issues here uh, in Estonia uh, through a number of measures, um, uh, largely architectural. In order to have people's trust, you need to have a system that is secure and trustworthy. Um, the most important element for any of this is, the, is a secure identity. And if anyone here, no, no. the only way you're going to have at this point anything that could be considered remotely, remotely secure is something that uses a two-factor identification, uh, be nice if it's it's using a public key infrastructure, PKI, you can look it up on Wikipedia, it's very nicely explained there. Um, but using a password and a username is not a secure way to do things. You need a unique identity. This is the problem of the internet in its most elementary form. If you do not know who it is that is coming into your system, if, you, if, if some dog is coming in under your name, which with a simple name and password or username and password system is very, very easy to do, then they can do what they want. So you need a unique identity. What that means, a lot of people don't like because the way you're going to have a, you're going to have a unique identity is when I said it's a two-factor system. At least one of those things has to be uh, one of the two factors that have to be mashed up has to be on a chip, either in your phone or on a card. But it has to be something sophisticated enough that it really.
can only belong to you or your phone. And then the other part, the other factor has to be is something you know, or it's your iris, or it's your fingerprint. Um, so these are, I mean, though, that's the sine qua non for, secure, for a secure identity. Now, a lot of countries say, oh, no, we don't want an identity system. We'll never have an identity system. Um, you know, like the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, they're completely against it. And um, which are incidentally also the five eyes, if you know what the five eyes are. But the five eyes countries are the ones that are completely against having a national ID. And then if you don't have it, you're, go you're not going to be secure. Uh, you remember Al Gore about 25 years ago said that the internet is the information superhighway? It really is. It is the information superhighway. There's, and you've got 100 million lanes, and everyone's on, driving on this road. There's one problem. If you don't have a unique ID, no one, not a single car has a license plate. You don't know who's doing what. And you're driving down that road, and you don't know who did what to you, and someone crashes into you, and you go, well, I guess someone crashed into me. So we need, you need a digital ID, identity. Here in Sony, we've issued a million of them to our people. Uh, Finland, and so everyone has one. Uh, you don't have to use it, but in general, it makes a lot of sense as life is much easier. Um, Finland has um, issued about, um, I guess, has issued cards to about 15% of its population. Um, we see ID cards, digital ID cards coming in in Armenia and Georgia, I guess in Moldova. Um, in our system, it works with through a private-public uh, pri uh, partnership in authentication because the bank for the banks it's important to know who's who. For us, it's important to know who's who. So the authentication system works um, through a through this. Uh, the authentication system is is financed and run by a consortium of banks and the government. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail, but. But one of the things that uh, we also had to deal with uh, that allowed us to, I think, make a more secure system is the other side of the architecture. We call it X-Road, but basically it's an enterprise service bus. It's a digital exchange layer that allows different systems to talk to each other, always using their own ID systems. But the point is that why we ended up with this system that is far more secure than having a big server farm uh, is that we were too poor to have a big server farm in the early 90s. And so, I mean, everyone had their own little server. And uh, the idea was, okay, well, now we're going to have to combine everything, put it all together. And we said, we don't have money for that. Uh, so uh, a couple of very smart people who were then still very young uh, developed the system of exchanging information uh, from server to server, always through the authentication system, which was always giving a check on who's doing what, who's going, who is moving and asking for what information. That ended up giving us, in, this is classical serendipity, you're looking for one thing, you find another, another, we're looking for something cheap. We ended up something which was cheap, but far more secure, because it means that if you get into the system, you never, if, I mean, if you actually break into the system, you only break into one system, one person. Uh, you can't go around, you can't go fishing, because everything has to be validated and, uh, and, and ascertained by the uh, authentication for that one person, or for that one official, or for that one computer that actually has, has uh, stores those data. Now, that means that, uh, that means basically we have one of the best systems around because first of all, no one's really managed to hack our ID system to get in, and then if you can't get in, then uh, then doesn't matter anyway. But the combination of these two it makes our system at this point very secure. Nonetheless, I should say, don't think that it's one anything is 100% secure. Nothing is ever 100% secure. We have a higher, far higher level of confidence in the security of our system uh, and the fact that no one in the past 15 years has had any money stolen from the banks, that we haven't had um, well, all kinds of bad things have not happened thanks to this system or we're using this system. Um, 
you know, we people trust it. 99% of, of, of prescriptions in this country are done digitally. You, the doctor doesn't give you a piece of paper. I mean, he puts it in the computer. You go to any pharmacy in, in Estonia, put in your card, put in your number, and you get your prescription. Um, and this is the kind of system that should be ideal for across borders within the European Union, but that will take time because not everyone is so, is so used to all of this, but an interoperable system is, I think, where we should be heading within the European Union uh, and more broadly between countries in general uh, if there is enough mutual trust. Uh, so there are a number of areas that I tried to touch upon that um, talk about the issues faced by digitization of society, everything from actual physical security, national security, to things like freedom of speech, privacy, transparency, and most importantly, development, which is what it really is about. I mean, development is about doing all of those things that I mentioned in a liberal democracy. You, you know, Stalinist forced industrialization is not our bag here, uh, if you know what I mean. So. Anyway, I'd like to thank you all. I have to go give another talk right away, so I have to run. Thank you. Thank you.